Hi, welcome to a joint podcast with me, Navad Ravi Kumar of StatementGuru.com. And can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. So my name is Steve Schwartz, and I run the College Admissions Toolbox podcast and website. And I thought it'd be fun for us to do this kind of crossover collaboration podcast episode. Thanks for being open to doing this. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to it. So uh, let's uh, maybe we'll start with a little bit about our backgrounds and then kind of go from there. Uh, so, Steve, um, I looked up a little bit about you. So it sounds like you kind of you got into Columbia and then you kind of realized maybe that your your essay or your uh, background was a little bit not traditional yet. You felt like your essay kind of helped get paved the way. Can you tell me a little bit more about that process? Yeah, sure. So basically, my SAT score, and my GPA weren't really Ivy League level material. They were good, but not great. My numbers, so my numbers didn't really tell the full story, but my extracurricular activities were quite unique. And I think that's what really ultimately got me in. And the admission officer even told me so afterwards. Okay. And so I, I highlighted that activity in my essays and my letters of recommendation and my resume and such. And for those who are wondering, well, what was the activity? It was going to a United Nations conference in South Africa on sustainable development and lobbying government delegates there. And so they were wondering, how did a high school kid end up doing that? And my essay told the story, my letters of rec told the story. And so what I do now is I help other applicants, current high schoolers do the same. I help them craft compelling extracurricular activities and then highlight them in their essays. So you have kind of a comprehensive approach where you, might, where you might work with students a little earlier than their actual application to kind of help them build that narrative? Yeah, I typically work with, with applicants typically in their sophomore or junior year of high school. But if it's end of junior year or the summer before senior year, I help them make the most of the time remaining. And even if they don't have any particular extracurricular on the level of that I did, there's still a way to find something impressive and unique to showcase in the essay. So it, my focus is very specifically on the essays. So a lot of times by the time they get to me, it's like, oh, how are we going to make this work? Because <laughs> you know, maybe they, ha they haven't taken advantage of the opportunities the best they can. But you know, I, I sort of you know, work with the hand that's been dealt in a sense. Um, there's some, in some cases, uh, somebody, you know, they'll come to me a little earlier. So I'm able to be like, all right, like, let's maximize the time you do have left. Uh, so to get to talk a little about my background, I never really intended to get into edu the educational field. Um, I was I was actually really interested in film and screenwriting. Uh, so my background was definitely a, of a storytelling and kind of like a narrative and fiction and short stories and that kind of thing. And with sp specifically with film and screenwriting is kind of my focus. Um, but what I as I was kind of working some jobs, some day jobs. I was doing things that were kind of related to content. Like I was a newsletter editor for a film festival at one point. And so everybody around me, like my coworkers kind of knew me as this really good writer. So at, at one point, everybody was starting to apply for graduate schools. And they were all, they were all very scared about the, their admissions uh, essays and their personal statements. Like there was a med school applicant who was like, I have no idea what I'm doing here. And I, I was like, neither do I, but uh, you know, I'm happy to take a look at it. And it kind of built organically from there like I, I just sort of relied on a lot of things I had learned from screenwriting and kind of my own trial and error about like what's what makes a good story um, and it just sort of happened to make some for some good essays sort of accidentally it's kind of like well whatever well something I hear is working because they had a lot of success with at least in that initial batch of people that came asking me if I, if I could take a look at their stuff. And so, you know, from there, you know, I was like, what the heck? Well, let me put up a website and see what happens. Nobody came to that website for like five years. But <laughs> um, yeah, it's been an interesting path. Uh, for a while, I was only almost exclusively working with people in India and internationally because I was advertising. Like, it's cheaper to advertise on Facebook there than it is here. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, for a couple of years, it was like, like a ton of people in India, uh, mostly applying for uh, engineering programs. Um, but now I, I would say probably 80% of my uh, clients are in the U.S., a lot of them in the L.A. area. I live in the L.A. area. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, like I said, I do mo mostly writing admissions essays, personal statements type of stuff across all fields, like graduate, undergraduate. And that's maybe something we could talk about in terms of the different um, specifics of that kind of thing. But, yeah, that's sort of my backstory. Well, that's really funny. That's quite a story. So you kind of stumbled across this idea that storytelling is what makes great essay, makes for great essays in the end. 
Yeah, and you know, uh, when I talk to sort of people who are interested in what I do, and you know, I have that initial call with them, you, you know, it's like one thing I always say is like, you know, what makes you unique? What makes this memorable? And to me, it's not all that different from if you're pitching a movie, like if you're a, a, pitching a, a, a plot or an idea for a movie or a TV show to an executive, it's like you have to kind of hook them in 30 seconds, actually le probably less than 30 seconds. And if you're not sort of uh, revealing something interesting or some con conceptual thing, um, people can get pretty bored quit pretty quickly. So, and, and I also think of it not even in terms of the experience of reading it, but if somebody of uh, some admissions persons read uh, hundreds of essays, how are they going to look back upon yours? Are they going to remember it at all? And I tell them, I've probably read thousands, if not tens of thousands of essays at this point. And there's maybe 10 to 20 that I can sort of name off the top of my head. And, you know, what is it about that, those 10 or 20 that kind of stick out in my mind? And a lot of it is they're thinking of things that, or expressing things in ways that nobody else is. It's like, sometimes it can be very visual. Sometimes it could be like a theme that I haven't seen before. Sometimes it could be, uh, you, you know, something as simple as, you know, science fiction movies. I, like I worked with uh, somebody uh, a few years ago where they really just love science fiction movies and they got into kind of graphics and CG sort of based off of their love of the Terminator and, <laughs> you know, these like uh, Avatar and movies like that. And even though they didn't really have anything to do with making those movies, <laughs> yeah, the fact that they, it was such an integral part of their development and their kind of story, it's just like, you know, why not sort of create some the thematic element to that? And then that can be sort of our introduction to this person. And, you know, that, that turned into this kind of interesting, like, oh, I've never seen this before kind of an essay. I love that idea because you do need the hook, but you don't necessarily have to have cr started your own nonprofit organization yeah. or won some big championship. Even your reflections on one of those events and how they impacted you or if you tried something and it failed miserably, talking yeah. about that and highlighting and even celebrating that and showing- Failure you know, is fertile grounds for, you know. yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I think I stepped on what you were saying there a little bit, uh, but I was saying for failure is fertile grounds for a lot of admissions essays. And that's definitely true where people will kind of sheepishly talk about some event that didn't go the way they thought wanted or, uh, you know, like I had one person whose undergrad was littered with a lot of withdrawals and like really just, a bad transcript and I was like okay this is not great for some elements of your uh, profile but it could make for a really really good admissions essay as long as you have that redemption at the end as long as it's not like oh and I'm probably going to flunk out of your program it's like as long as <laughs> you know you don't create that as the impression it's more like I made some mistakes and I'm kind of better off as a result like if you can kind of create that impression those kind of failures can make for the best essays actually Exactly. You want to end on a high note, not like exactly. I failed and this sucks and my life is ruined and I, I don't know what I'll do next. <laughs> I failed. These are the lessons learned and here's what I plan to do differently going forward. And if, yeah. you're, not, if you're not failing, I think it means that you're not trying hard enough. You're not setting your sights high enough. Yeah. And I noticed that, you know, I work with a lot of pre-meds and sometimes they're kind of too perfect in that like, oh, I've done this research project and I've done this volunteering and I've shadowed these doctors and I have a 3.8 GPA. And it's like, you know, you might get into a really great medical school because, you know, that's a really great set of uh, stats you have working for you. But it's really, really hard for me to work with that to make uh, an amazing uh, personal statement on a set for a, a medical school application. You know, we'll do what we can and we'll find those kind of corners and those kind of moments. And, and I think what you said was really insightful about you don't have to have you know, cured cancer, but, it, but, or, you know, like you said, started a nonprofit, but a lot of the very things that are most meaningful to you um, are maybe objectively not super groundbreaking or world changing. But the, what, what I think is great about the essay is you can frame things in a way where even if it's not objectively this amazing and groundbreaking thing, you can sort of present it in a way that it's like it's meaningful to you and therefore it kind of illustrates some deeper things about you. So it is a way of getting to know you and sh showing how unique you are. Exactly. I think it's a way to, for the applicant to demonstrate insight and maturity and humility and also to paint a more human side of themselves than what the numbers can show. Like the, the picture you painted of the, of the perfect pre-med applicant, that's not the most, that, 
that's great from a numbers perspective for in the admissions index, you know, especially for grad level programs that are driven by the U.S. news rankings and such. Mm -hmm. But I think especially for undergrad in the liberal arts in particular, mm -hmm. they are looking, they obviously know that a 17 or 18 year old is not a perfect, fully formed human being. And there's still plenty of growth for them going forward. And if you're not open to something new and realizing that you're not perfect as you are right now, you know, you, undergrad is meant to open up new doors for you and to help you gain insights along the way, but you have to be ready for them when you step foot on campus. Yeah, so maybe that's a good segue to talk about the sort of undergrad as kind of a unique beast, and then maybe we can talk about a little bit about the contrast between undergrad and graduate school applications from there. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I think that one of the biggest differences I can think of is that, in my, in my understanding at least, undergrad the numbers aren't as big a piece of the pie of your chances. There's your SAT score or ACT if they're t taking test scores. There's your GPA, but there's also your essays, your rec letters, your list of accomplishments, all the various short essays and so on. But I get the sense that on the graduate level, numbers are more important. But I would imagine that in the essays, they're looking for something a bit different. But I also think that there's maybe less factors at play for grad school. So that it might increase the importance of the essay in some ways because there's less factors to kind of go by in, in a certain sense because with like you're saying with undergrad there's so many things to look at the transcript is so vast for, for looking at four years worth uh I, well i guess undergrad is four years too but i i think there's just a lot of factors at play in an undergrad so uh i i get what you're saying uh, but i also think you know i think they're both really important in terms of like the essay but I, I definitely see, take your point about sort of that distinction. Um, in terms of the, uh, like, what do you think are the kind of pe peculiarities of uh, an undergrad essay, for example, versus a statement of purpose for a grad program? Well, I think that the undergrad essay has a lot more room to be personal, you know, for undergraduate admissions, because there isn't really the same level of work experience expected on the part of the applicant. So I think the biggest difference may be, in fact, work experience. A high schooler may have had an internship or volunteer work or some kind of part-time job, but they're not expecting you to have had a serious office environment experience when you're only 17 or 18 years old. So I think that they're opening up a lot more for open, they're a lot more open to talking about extracurriculars like I discussed previously or anything at all that's personal nature. It could be a hobby, but I think I would expect that the statement of purpose for grad level is meant to be more serious and it's a bit more a bit more specific in terms of what exactly they're looking for. Um, I think with a graduate school application or an admissions essay, it's there's certain things you kind of have to do. Uh, a lot of times you will kind of talk about the specifics of the program you're in question, or you'll talk about the need for this kind of degree in terms of your long-term career prospects or your educational uh, journey. Um, so that's definitely true. And also kind of like, you know, why are you interested in this thing? Uh, so it is very kind of forward looking in that sense. It's like I, because it's even things that are very popular, like, you know, a lot of people apply to medical school and law school, but it's still a fraction of the amount of people that apply for undergrad programs, right? So by the nature of, okay, I've made a very conscious, it's not a ge generic, I, I want to get a college degree. That's like a lot of people think that and that, you know, more power to them. A, it's a much more conscious choice to be like, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be an engineer. And there's kind of, it's almost like a little existential in a way, like out of all the thousands of tens of thousands of things to spend your life doing, why is it this one thing above all others? Um, and I think that's, that's a really interesting kind of topic of like, you know, why is this such a burning passion? And, you know, what is the kind of origin story to how did I come across that? And what are the steps that I needed to kind of get to this point of, I'm going to assert that I'm going to dedicate my life to this one kind of discipline. In undergrad, I think it is a little more wide open, like you're saying. And I, I've noticed there is, I think it that lends itself to a little more nuance. And like, you can write a common app essay about the, the true meaning of friendship or something like that. Um, so I, I think, you know, I have noticed you can have kind of like a little bit of more of a short story quality a lot of times with these undergraduate essays. And so you can have a little more poetic license. Like I had one client a few a couple of years ago who he wanted to integrate bits of poetry, like 
lyric, you know, lines of his own poetry into the admissions essay. And initially I was kind of like, Ugh, that's, I don't know how they're going to react, how admissions people are going to react to that. But I, at, the, at the end of the day, I was like, if this is really meaningful to you and it says something about you, you know, by all means, you know, we'll, we'll figure out a way to make it work while still kind of doing the things that I think are important with admissions essay. And he did like an early uh, decision and he got into his like the basically he applied to one school and he got into it so hey, it worked out that's a that's a great example wow and I, I can't believe it actually worked I guess that really goes to show the power of the services of someone like yourself to do that to implement that yeah to treat an essay in the right way because I'd imagine that there are so many cases where being too creative can go wrong well I can imagine a lot of people saying that's not, that's not something we that is looked favorably upon and we don't do that here so let's kind of follow our conception of what what is a good essay so um you know that's something i try to do is i don't want to be so like we have to follow this formula there's this is the 10 steps to get to an essay there's things i've learned and there's kind of best practices and there's directions that i try to steer them in but i also believe that the essays that works best are the ones that are meaningful to them and they're more likely to work on it more anyway. So, uh, you know, if, if it turns into like, Oh, this is a drag and this isn't really what I want to be doing. They're going to, their interest level is going to drop pretty precipitously. And so I try to maintain this like, Oh, this is fun. <laughs> um, and it, you know, it, it's sort of like, well, you have to also have to eat your, some of your vegetables too, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, I try to enforce some like, I don't want it to be this total free for all. Like, let's just kind of be wacky and do whatever. And, you know, they'll respect our, 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 our chutzpah kind of <laughs> like, I, I want it to be productive and get to a place where like they're happy with the results and they feel like it's organic to them. Well, at the same time, like I look at it and be like, you know what, it, it accomplishes the thing that it needs to. Like there's some maybe transformation, there's some growth, there's some insights and, you know, more than anything, like, it's a memorable essay and you know, it makes me want to meet this person. It makes me excited. It makes me want to root for this person. Yeah. I think that's a great point. So we have creativity and personality, but within certain boundaries. And then at the same time, you also want to make them like you. I think that's true regardless of whether it's undergrad or grad level, whether it's open, a little bit more open-ended and free flowing, or if it's more constrained in terms of like the statement of purpose. And I think the very name of these essays, one is you know, a, personal statement or a college essay versus a statement of purpose, which is your purpose. Why are you going to grad school if it's med or PhD or business or law versus a college applicant, a 17 year old or 18 year old, they don't need to know the entire course of their career going forward. It's, it's nice if they have an idea and if they do, they should mention that at some point. Yeah. You know what? You can go, you can be undecided. Yeah. One caveat since I'm in California is the, I don't know if you've worked too much with the University of California essays, yeah. uh, but they kind of prefer it being a little util, utilitarian in terms of like, it's hard the way it is. It's almost like it's hard to be very pro, you know, create, cre, uh, create, sorry, creative writing kind of like, I, I don't think the poetry sprinkled in would fly in one of those essays. Um, so I think there are kind of gradients to how free flowing and how kind of, artsy you can be with some of these undergrad essays but it, like sort of the, the UC essays might be a little bit more on the like I wouldn't say it's a statement of purpose per se but it, it is a little bit more like okay what is one problem you had to solve or like what is one thing about yourself that is a unique characteristic or something so those essays it's a little bit more like a little bit more pragmatic maybe no well, I agree I, to be quite honest I probably wouldn't be as, as daring as you to include poetry in an essay, no matter, no matter what. I, I tend to be a, a bit more on the conservative side, but there are arguments to each end. But I think that even, I, I guess when I say more free-flowing or even creative, I would think like a topic such as, as you mentioned, the true meaning of friendship or, or talking about how you like flower arranging or cooking or something like that, you know, hobbies versus yeah. the more practical, like here's how I finish my term paper in two weeks or here's how I planned my schedule to complete an assignment which is maybe not as exciting, but in, and a bit more pragmatic, like you said. It has sort of these real, real world kind of implications, maybe. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. 
So uh, what do you, do you see any trends in kind of the industry and sort of what colleges are looking for? And maybe we can maybe touch upon the recent scandal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And how maybe that, how uh, potential uh, uh, students might look at that and how, what we do. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I think, first of all, just recent trends over, over the years, I've noticed, I think the biggest thing is that, you know, when I, when I started doing this work, the big topic used to be leadership. Everybody wanted to be the leader of a student organization at their high school. And the goal was to become president of that club or editor in chief of the newspaper. And I think that the focus has shifted over time as admission officers have come to see that many applicants do things just to get into college. And it's not always about leadership. Sometimes the person in the back of the room or maybe the person who's a little bit quieter is actually contributing a great deal and has a great deal of potential as well. So yeah. I think the focus has shifted much more to, as we talked about, failure, especially you know, in Silicon Valley startup mentality, failure is celebrated, being vulnerable is an open about your mistakes is a good thing. But you, of course, you do want to, with, with the caveat that you, you've learned from them and you're ending on a high new, note moving forward about the lessons learned. As for, as for the scandal, I guess the, the biggest takeaway I would want to leave students with is there's always been certain inequities in admissions. People with money do have an advantage that's not really changing, mm -hmm. but you don't have to break the rules in order to get in. There are ethical ways to do this where you can still maximize your chances. Yeah, and I mean, what they were doing there was just like outright fraud. Exactly, uh, yeah. And, you know, there is a way to sort of be responsible about it and just be, you know, a lot of people, like I think, so, like I'm an, an essay person, so a lot of people that I work with, it's like, they almost don't even really understand on a, on a fundamental level how to put one of these together. It's like the writing they're familiar with, they're familiar with is maybe emailing or doing a term paper or just sort of like day to day, like a shopping list or something. So I, I think it's sort of inherently unfair to just kind of be tasked with what might be the most important writing sample of their entire lives and without them having any clue for how to approach it it's just kind of like well good luck and i i do think because there have been a lot of them have been trained into you know like whatever lab reports or term papers they, they they've been indoctrinated into a certain way of writing and you know maybe this is a failing of public schools or the educational system in general that a lot of them it's just their whole approach is just counterproductive to the kind of writing and the expectations of this kind of writing so you know, my, I feel like my task more than anything is to just give them a different in, uh, insights into a different, a totally different kind of writing and one that'll probably serve them better in the long run in terms of, you know, just write like a normal person, like just be authentic and sort of be who you are and make your arguments effectively and sort of here's how to put something together that is, is compelling and persuasive and memorable. And I, like, to me, it's just like, I'm just telling them how to write well. And a lot of my clients will be like, like I didn't sign up, I signed up for basically a better personal statement, but I use a lot of what you taught me just on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis now. And I'm like, that's like the greatest, one of the greatest things you, I could hear from a former client. No, that's absolutely true that, you know, they might sign up just to get help with this particular essay, but what they don't realize is that they're learning how to write well, and they're also learning more about themselves. It's, a, it's kind of a self-exploration process to, to write in a personal way. A lot of times we just go about our day to day and are living in the moment, in the present, with the task with whatever's in front of us. But really, we don't take the time to step back and reflect. And especially for someone embarking on a new journey of college or graduate school and clarifying their reasons for wanting to engage in that sort of program or even for undergrad, if it's not specific to college in nature, but just wh where are you at this point in life and what's been a deep, you know, mind opening experience for you? And helping walk applicants through that process, it really is a form of counseling. Yeah, that's definitely true. And it's also, you know, it's also it's like like a mission statement as well. It's at the same, but at the same time, it's a formal writing exercise or applications process, a, a, a therapy exercise and a kind of business marketing exercise. Exactly. It's a, it's a strange combination of, of all of those and, and much more as well. Yeah. And, and sort of back to your therapy point, it's, that's what I like most about what I do is just kind of talking to people. And, you know, I get an email or a call from somebody and two days later, or even sometimes the next day, I'm in a coffee shop somewhere that I've never been to in LA and being like, Hey, I'm Nevada. Nice to meet you. Let's talk. And, you know, usually that initial uh, session is like just two hours of straight up talking and 
kind of just being like, okay, tell me more about this. And a lot of times they, they sort of have a conversation of the type that they don't really normally have among people that already know them well, or people that are like, oh, this person is in my class, so they kind of have the same lived experience as me, or this person's my family, and we've lived in the, under the same roof for 17 or 18 years. Uh, so they, a lot of them just don't have this external person who's like, I don't know anything about you. I don't have like an agenda. I'm not trying to sort of do this. I'm not trying to mess you up. I'm not trying to do anything other than sort of find out what I need to know to kind of get you to where you want to be. Uh, so uh, you were saying something before? Oh yeah, just you know, I think the idea of having an objective third party, someone who's not a friend or family member who can really just look at you anew, as a, you know, look at you fresh for the first, meet you for the first time. And it's much better to have that person be someone like you or I than to have that be the admission officer, be the first person read your essay. And a lot of times friends and family don't really know what a good essay topic yeah, is or what yeah. essay looks like. And they might be afraid to tell you that it's not great. Or yeah. they might tell you it's not great when it actually is because they, they just don't know what admission officers are looking for the way that you and I do because we, we've been through the process countless yeah. times. Yeah, and they, they're invested in it. And, you know, sometimes there'll be certain things, that, I mean, that, that, that happen, but it, it, it's like memories can change or things a sibling might remember things a certain way uh, of like, oh, well, it was, I remember it was a little bit more like this. And it, and then we're talking about events that happened 20 years ago. And it's like, uh, it's so nitpicky yet. I've noticed that a lot of times a sibling or a parent will just like, be like, oh, this essay is not working because of that one line of something that happened 20 years ago. <laughs> and it, it's like, it's really not that important here. Right. Uh, so I think that kind of distortion of what's, really important in an essay can get kind of get a little kind of out of whack when you're dealing with friends and family. Definitely, definitely. I suppose since you brought up this scandal and I was thinking about people breaking the rules, I just wanted to clarify for anyone listening or watching this that our job is to provide the space for people to open up and share those personal things and then we help them craft those into an essay. We're not writing the essays for them, which is maybe what some people are looking for, but overall we're Letting, we're kind of providing the space for them to do the best writing possible yeah. and help them structure that into a, a, a framework that will work best for admissions. And I will tell you, it's, you can't really just totally fake a good essay. No. Because it's, it's just going to sound, it's not going to ring true. It's not going to be authentic. And especially at these very higher tier schools, you know, they, there's an interview. <laughs> it's like, it, it's, it's going to be very incongruent to have this totally manufactured essay and then the person's showing up and they're speaking kind of broken English or something. <laughs> Especially for the college level. I mean, college admissions. Admission yeah. officers know what a 17-year-old sounds like versus someone in their 30s, 40s, 50s, or so on. And so the, my job, part of my job is really to make sure the student's voice remains within the essay. I may provide some edits, either topical or grammatical, because we don't want there to be any mistakes. But it is the student's voice that shines through in the end. And, and you know, one thing I try to stress is, you know, everybody knows that there's a 10 to 20 schools that are considered the gold standard in the world or whatever. But that might not be the best school for every single person. And I think just this get into these places, that mentality, I think, is really kind of toxic. And, you, you know, it's like in the in this scandal, for example, it's like, those people got in these schools and, you know, they're in probably every single case, it was probably not a good fit. And there's probably a school that they could have gone into uh, the right way that, 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 that would have actually served them better professionally because they would have been more involved and they would have found a better circle of friends that is more similar to them. And then kind of, you know, maybe they would have been more engaged with student government or some kind of a, a club or whatever. And, you know, that like, so I, I just, I, I really want to counter this mentality of your your value is based off of the ranking of your school, and you know some people, yeah, they are gonna, you know, you went into you got you went to a really top school, and you know I don't want I don't want to take anything away from that. I'm sure it was a great experience, but I, I also think this do this or else your life will be horrible is is a really kind of counterproductive and kind of toxic mentality, and. You know, for example, I work with a lot of engineers and those schools are maybe not the be all end all when you look at it from an engineering point of view. And, you know, a lot of those people would rather go to Georgia Tech versus Harvard, for example. And, you know, 
and every discipline is kind of different. And, uh, you know, for example, I think, you know, UC Riverside is the lowest ranked UC school, but I think it's top 10 in the country for psychology grad programs, for example. And so I would definitely encourage people to kind of look beneath the surface of some of these rankings and be like, what, what is important to me and what, what do I want to do in my career? And, you know, there's a lot of destinations that where you'll have a better education and in the long run, you'll have a better career because you're kind of where you belong. Now, I could not agree more 100% with you on this. I think the rankings driven mentality is absolutely wrong. Obviously, rankings have their place, but there's so much more. I mean, first off, you know, do you want a large school or a small school? Do you want urban, suburban or rural? And then what do you want the focus of the school to be? If you're major, if you want to major in, let's say, philosophy, but there are hardly any philosophy majors at this school and their program is not particularly strong, and most people are majoring in econ or engineering, then you're probably in the wrong place. Yeah. And especially for the grad level. I mean, my God, you know, that's the variance between the rankings for you know, brand name overall on the, on the university level as a whole yeah. versus one particular grad program or even undergrad program. There could be a major difference in the experience that you'll have there versus what the brand name cachet may may bring. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, like UCLA and Berkeley are kind of the brand names in the UC school system. And there's okay, there's people that have had good experiences there, but there's so many people that I've met that just did not enjoy their time there. It's such a giant kind of factory, basically. It's just like there's so many students, there's so much bureaucracy that you're just one out of tens of thousands and like you could sort of you know flunk out and people nobody would really notice kind of thing. I mean maybe your roommate but well so, I would imagine the admin to student ratio at those schools is is not as as not as as not as ideal as it would be at a smaller liberal arts school yeah and you know the, if you get into that school it is an accomplishment it's really hard to get into those programs and you worked hard and you know maybe you'll have a really great time there but you know, a lot of people will discount a place like UC Riverside or UC whatever, UC Santa Cruz, because it's not as highly ranked. But I've, I've met people that think UC Santa Cruz is like the greatest place in the world, you know, and it's like they have like they have so much love for that place in, in a way that I've never seen from a Berkeley undergrad. So, you know, you know, just think about wait, what is important to you? What is like, a, like the size, like the, the like you're saying the ratio, the, you know, what what is the culture um there's so many different things and it's like ultimately it's not your parents it's not even us that is going to be there for four years it's going to be you know the student it's going to be you and you have to really think about like is this the the place for me that i'm going to just like am i going to flourish here am i going to be excited to kind of walk around on this campus every single day exactly and just to highlight a few east coast schools for those who are looking on the east coast i want to make a contrast between columbia university where i went which has a very the core curriculum is a very big part of the undergraduate college. A third of your classes are defined within specific parameters so that everyone has a, has a common basis of understanding, especially in literature and philosophy. And so, so lots of requirements at Columbia versus a school like Brown, which has no requirements at all. And so yeah. students probably wouldn't want to apply to both of those. They may have a preference for one type of constraint over no constraint at all. Yeah, yeah. So it's like those are kind of the two extremes, and they're both in the same. You know, they're both Ivy Leagues. Yeah, they're, they're both, both you know really among the highest end of sort of the echelon of uh, academic rankings. But you'll have a vastly different experience in each, either of those places. And and you know, Brown is in this pretty small city. It's you know, it, it's, it's like Providence, Rhode Island versus yeah. New York City. Yeah, yeah. New York City is I've heard is pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> so. So yeah, that, I think that's a great point. And you know, a lot of people will just kind of automatically be like, okay, these are both Ivy League. I, that sounds great. I'm going to apply to both of them. But without really thinking through, it's like, you know, you're get, getting a vastly different experience uh, in both of those places, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I, I want to highlight for those who are looking for more colleges that may be a better fit or maybe more have a more personal feel, I'd highly recommend checking out the Colleges That Change Lives list. Which uh, really breaks down a lot of the a lot of I, I think they're mainly small liberal arts colleges, but okay. they're colleges that don't really get all the the all the the, the news and the flashiness that the top ranked Ivies and other tier ones. You know, the sort of the reality of a lot of those rankings is like research counts for a lot of those kind of gaudy numbers. Mm -hmm. and 
whenever you have a very research heavy institution, I mean, there's advantages of that, but a lot of times you have so, like professors that are kind of too busy for you. A lot of times you have big classes that are a little impersonal. Um, I don't, I don't want to say always there's exceptions and, you know, you, there are schools that kind of are able to balance the two, but a lot of the small liberal arts schools, you, you are, there's the professors are so focused on you. Teaching is kind of the prim, primarily what they do, even if they're kind of, uh, have written these renowned books and they're really kind of noteworthy in other ways. Uh, so, it, but a lot of those schools don't get a lot of press because they're not publishing all these, you know, big articles and, you know, they don't have these big grad programs. So a lot of even, you know, even though they're undergraduate rankings, a lot of times they're powered a lot of times by the medical school division and the, the like the legal or the law school and the business school that are publishing all the time and are just doing a lot of heavy duty sort of work on other fronts. And that is going to kind of bring up the undergraduate rankings, even if it's a lot of times not even sort of reflecting of the undergraduate experience. Oh, exactly. 100%. And the rankings also include ridiculous factors like the size of the library or mm -hmm. you know, money expenditures per student. And obviously, there's, it's easy to spend more money per student. You spend yeah. more money on things that aren't really oh, necessary. You know, endowment per student. It's like, I don't oh, yeah. know. I know Columbia has a pretty, pretty big endowment. I don't know how much of that they sort of wrote a check for to you, but I'm guessing. Right. <laughs> It doesn't, really, it doesn't really come back to the students necessarily <laughs> but on all kinds of things. But I'm sure it's like, oh, that sounds great for, you know, rank, or rank, for the methodology of this ranking. Like every student gets $10 million. That sounds great. Yeah. No, I think most people could agree the rankings are due for a major overhaul. <laughs> probably should be, should be disregarded to a large extent. In yeah. fact, instead, visiting the school, talking with current students, talking with graduates, talking with the admissions folks, and actually getting a, a sense of what the flavor of that school is like. Exactly. Uh, so, Steve, so to wrap up here, um, do you have any kind of advice maybe for people that are in the process, maybe for undergrads that are in, approaching the summer right now, where they should be in the process? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that's a great place to wrap up. So I, th I think the biggest thing at this point, making the most of your summer, getting a summer activity or something to do over the summer lined up if you don't already have it lined up. There are definitely still opportunities to volunteer or to get some work experience of some kind this summer. And also, and I think you would agree with that, is start working on the essays already. It's never too early to start, start working on your essays, even getting your rough drafts done, getting something down on paper or on the screen. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of the method of fast, bad, and wrong, meaning <laughs> write quickly for your rough draft. Don't edit as you write. Yeah, don't don't worry about how good it is. At the, at the start, you can always improve it later. And yes, yeah, so just don't worry about getting it done. Even if you misspell things, even if your grammar is awful, that's mm -hmm. okay. Content first editing later and i do have a standing offer for people if they want to send me their drafts maybe not you know like 10 different drafts of essays but if you want to send me something at contact at statementguru.com uh i offer just sort of like a quick read and then i'm happy to kind of jump on the phone with you for a couple minutes and just be like hey here's what i think and if you're interested here's ways we can maybe work together oh that's awesome that's a great offer that you're putting out there i love that so what's the best way for folks to reach you? I know you get, you just gave your email, but you want to share your podcast and website. Yeah. So my podcast isn't super uh, active, but you can find it on, uh, I think it's uh, Podomatic. <laughs> I think it's statementguru.podomatic.com. So you'll see uh, some of those episodes. I talked to just some people. I know you're big on the podcasting front. So uh, is there a, a URL they can do, go to for that? Yeah, sure. So my website is College Admissions Toolbox. They can check out collegeadmissionstoolbox.com. They can also listen to the, to the College Admissions Toolbox podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and pretty much everywhere else. Yeah, I think mine shows up on uh, uh, iTunes as well. Uh, my website is statementguru.com. And like I had said before, uh, my email address is contact at statementguru.com. Great. Uh, so it's been a pleasure talking to you, Stephen. Um, so thank you. Let's, uh, let's do it again sometime. Yeah, definitely. Let's keep in